Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for August 9th, 2022. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics here at DAT, joined by Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst. Good morning, Dean. Good morning, Ken. How are you today? As we were talking, I'm on the better side of the cool front that blew through that's coming your way tomorrow. So I'm feeling less humid. I'm feeling airy. I got the, yeah. got the, the light pink duds on here, ready to roll. Yeah, this is unprecedented here in New England. We had a heat emergency on the weekend. Uh, we haven't seen, normally you see some hot weather for a couple of weeks in July, but nothing like this for the last almost like two months now of extreme heat. It's been brutal. Yeah, flying back from Florida, you know, it was warmer and more humid in Ohio than when I, I mean, I was by the beach, but, you know, I can't complain. But I'm happy to be back in the great state of Ohio. We just got the preseason uh, NCAA football co coaches poll, which has uh, my Buckeyes at number two. Um, which I think is a good spot to be. Alabama is a clear cut number one, but um, should be a really great year. Hmm. All I right. Wish, I wish I could continue the conversation, but I'm, uh, <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about football. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. Oh, well, OH, right? Yep. So we're, if, for those not familiar with the show, we don't talk about football and weather. We just kind of open that way. We talk about the freight markets, data, trends we're seeing, uh, but most importantly, mm -hmm. answering your questions. The past few weeks, we've been getting tons of great questions, too many to answer, in fact. Uh, but go ahead and drop those in early down in the chat and comment section below. Um, once Dean gets rolling, I'll try to drop in there and monitor. We have marketing monitoring that, and we will answer them at the end of the show. But with that, let's go to our key points of the week. All right, so drive-in and reefer spot rates continue to hold their own um, with the, the with the decrease in fuel prices, um, which is another bu bullet point on here. Fuel dropped below five dollars a gallon last night for diesel. Um, we would expect that sort of competing pressure, the seasonality pushing one to push rates down, fuel prices I think giving us some support um, and strong volumes to be quite honest, which is a tease for a little bit later in the show. Uh, imports up two point four percent month over month and two percent year over year. Um, pretty much completely debunking any of that cliff nonsense that happened earlier this year. Uh, Class A truck orders down 33% month over month and 60% year over year. Again, I, I really think, and, and Dean will, I'm sure, cover more of this, this has more to do with the second half being pretty much sold out um, and order books not fully open up for 23 yet. Uh, East Coast port congestion, um, uh, pretty much a direct result of some uncertainty on the West Coast. Uh, we're seeing congestion grow there. And then the cash shipment index down 3.1% month over month in July. So with that, I will turn it over to Dean to walk us through our market update. Dean? Thanks, Ken. All right, let's get started with our uh, load to truck ratio for dry van this week. Uh, predictably low post volumes fell last week for the first week of the shipping month, down 8%. They're also down about 33% lower than this time last year. Uh, carry equipment posts increased 4%. Uh, last week, they're about 3% higher than 2019, which is the best benchmark we can provide for the volume of carriers looking for loads. Uh, of course, 2019 was an oversupplied market. As a result of the activity last week, uh, low posts uh, were, were um, uh, low truck ratio, sorry, was down to about 2017 levels, as you can see from the chart there at 3.59. Having a look at the refrigerated market, uh, the record breaking heat wave that we covered earlier in the show, especially in the East Coast and Central West, keeping reefer demand elevated. Uh, load post volumes are up last week only by about 5%. Carrier equipment posts were flat compared to the previous week, uh, but still at record levels for the start of August. Last week's load to truck ratio increased slightly to 7.76. And in flatbed, load post volumes continue to track almost identically with 2018 levels. Volumes last week were down 20% week over week. Um, they're about 40% lower than this time last year with uh, 2019 the only year to record lower load post volumes for the first week of August. Capacity continues to loosen clearly though in flatbed. Um, equipment posts exceed the previous record set in 2019 by 5%. Last week, load to truck ratio dropped uh, about 23% to 15.04. So having a look around our different markets on our market condition index, a bit of a focus this week on the intermodal market and increasing congestion and capacity issues. In the six major intermodal markets, Los Angeles, Ontario, Dallas, Kansas City, Joliet and Chicago, all impacted by congestion and capacity issues. Truckload capacity outbound increased last week, uh, sorry, capacity uh, tightened last week. Rates increased by three cents a mile in all of those markets combined. On the uh, major lane between Los Angeles and Chicago, dry van rates increased to $1.82. It's a heavy intermodal lane. That's about 11 cents per mile higher than the July average for land in Joliet, where the center point intermodal center 
uh, is located. That's the largest inland port in North America. Spot rates increased by seven cents a mile to an average outbound rate of 231. Load post volumes in dry van were up 6% last week, resulting in a reversal of the rates trend in July, which had declined, declined sorry, for the prior three weeks. Uh, having a look at Joliet to Worcester, it's another major intermodal lane. Worcester Mass is a big intermodal hub. Rates were 35 cents a mile higher last week, 286. Uh, capacity was also very tight on Joliet to Dallas lanes. Uh, spot rates increased by 53 cents a mile over the July average to 2.32. Joliet to Elizabeth, uh, rates were up almost 20 cents a mile to 2.53 last week. Elizabeth to Chicago, rates were flat at $1.51, while loads south of Atlanta were up slightly to $1.62. Uh, flash flooding and road closures along the Mississippi in the last few weeks. Um, in the Quincy market, Quincy, Illinois, uh, capacity was uh, very tight. Rates jumped 18 cents a mile last week to 235. They'd been dropping for the prior three weeks to the major flooding events that we've been seeing. Having a look at our uh, market condition index for refrigerated, um, staying out there in the uh, in the Midwest, Southwest Indiana and Southeast Illinois, um, a lot of flooding. Very uh, watermelons are in season. Growers are finding it very hard to get into the fields to uh, pick the uh, watermelons at the moment. Uh, regional spot rates in that particular area are 15 cents a mile to 219 last week. Uh, having a look at some of the individual markets, line haul rates in the Bloomington, Illinois market surged last week up 74 cents a mile to 336. That's line haul rates excluding fuel. Uh, loads from Bloomington, Illinois to Atlanta averaged 327 last week. That's 45 cents a mile higher than July, while loads east of Boston were flat at $2.15. On the west coast in San Diego, uh, spot rates for refrigerated loads increased 38 cents per mile last week to an average of 322. Load post volumes were up about 22% um, last week. It was a big increase in reefer imports. According to Piers data, banana imports dominate the inbound market. Predominantly, that's the main uh, fruit that comes into that particular port, it's mostly a refrigerated port. Bananas account for about 75% market share. The volume, most of the volume comes from Ecuador. So volumes are actually up uh, from Ecuador last month, about 72% last month. So it's pushing a lot more volume into the reefer spot market. Further north in Fresno's produce volumes were up slightly last week. Outbound rates remain flat though at 233. And on the east coast in Elizabeth, New Jersey, reefer capacity tightened. Uh, following a 26% month over month increase in load post volumes, rates increased by 13 cents a mile to $1.88. And in the flatbed market, capacity tightened in California again last week. There's been a 30% week over week increase in load post volumes. Outbound rates in Los Angeles to all destinations increased 11 cents a mile to 257, while further north in San Francisco, rates increased by 3 cents a mile to 253. Um, in California, Los Angeles is the largest of our flatbed markets in that particular state. Load post volumes have increased by almost 65% in the last month. Uh, loads 2,000 miles east to Minneapolis increased by 10 cents per mile to $1.62, while shorter haul loads to Stockton just outside of San Francisco increased by the same amount to 263. Having a look at the Pacific Northwest, Seattle outbound flatbed, flatbed rates increased by seven cents a mile to 219 last week, while on the 800 mile haul to Stockton, rates increased by 20 cents a mile above the July average to 255. Uh, in the Midwest, in Indianapolis, uh, the Indianapolis market capacity tightened last week. There was a surge in low post volume spot rates were up. 14 cents a mile to 326 and further north in Gary, Indiana capacity cooled for the fourth week in a row. Outbound loads averaged $3.14. That's down 19 cents a mile over the same time frame. And wrapping up our market update with a look at the year over year uh, change in spot rates, national average line haul rates excluding fuel are holding their own uh, after remaining flat last week at just under $1.97 per mile. Compared to our top 50 lanes measured by loads moved, uh, they were averaging 236. So the national average is about 36 cents per mile lower last week. Dry van line haul rates are also 44 cents per mile lower than this time last year, but still about 10, 10 cents per mile higher than 2018. And in the refrigerated market last week's rig line haul rate increased by two cents a mile to a national average of 226, still 54 cents a mile lower than the previous year and about eight cents per mile higher uh, than where reefer rates were in 2018. And then lastly, in flatbed, line haul rates have been tracking seasonally with 2018 levels following last week's four cent per mile decrease. 
are now about six cents per mile above those levels. The national average flatbed rate excluding fuel dropped to 242 per mile last week. That's about 28 cents per mile lower than this time last year and about 41%, 41 cents per mile higher than the average of uh, non-pandemic years. So that's it for this week's market update. If you'd like to find out more about what's happening, Great. Go to dat.com forward slash market update and download our weekly report. And with that, it's over to Ken for the short term forecast. Thank you kindly, Dean. All right. So, for our short term forecast, we're going to start with Dry Van as always. Just to remind everyone and to introduce this to anyone who might be new, the blue line is the historical rate um, observed by DAT. That's a seven day weighted moving average uh, per mile for long haul only, excluding fuel. Uh, and then you have a bunch of forecasts. That's the colorful lines to the right. So you have rate cast in green, a short term forecast in red, uh, which just more clo weights the closer data points as opposed to rate cast, which is looking further back. And then you have the uh, gray and yellow, which are blends of the, the, the two forecasts in varying degrees. So what does this mean for dry van? So as we've been talking about, this has been fairly consistent. The models are in agreement, at least through the uh, middle to end of August. Um, and then Ratecast is showing a little bit more strength on the upside, but still in pretty tight agreement. There's not more than a three to five cent spread there between all of the different forecasts heading out through uh, maybe the second week of September, if you look at the x-axis there. So it's expecting some uptick heading into back to school. Um, I think, again, as we continue to see downward pressure on diesel prices, um, and we start to get inched towards some of the seasonal uptick for peak shipping, I think this forecast is very reasonable. All right, let's move on to reefer. Uh, again, very tight alignment through the, the, the last week of August here, and even then, not much different. Um, what you're seeing is even the short-term forecast all the way through that beginning of September doesn't seem to break too much from Great cast. It does, however, um, start to slide a bit as we get into that first week of September compared to rate cast, which um, has a little bit of an upward tick. Again, I think a very reasonable set of forecasts here. Um, these trading ranges, as I mentioned last week and probably the week prior, are pretty narrow. You know, we're zoomed in here. Um, if you zoomed out, you know, maybe from a dollar fifty to three fifty, this would look like a rather flat, somewhat bumpy line. So just to be mindful, we're only talking about ten to fifteen cents a mile here, uh, which, while that isn't immaterial. Um, that's not a huge trading range. And now on to our controversial one, um, which is flatbed. Um, pretty much all the forecasts are expecting it to pull a UE here uh, in the last week of August. I, I think that's a bit optimistic, um, if I did, if I had to be honest. The, the year seems to be tracking very, very closely to 18. Um, we didn't see that behavior necessarily in 18. Um, we would really need to see some of the southern home building and, and things like that tick up or um, kind of anomalous activity in the shale regions around oil and gas, I think, for this forecast. Again, these aren't wide trading ranges. We're still talking about bottoming out at 240, and then even Ratecast has it topping out around 255. So 15 cents a mile for a flatbed, not tremendous. Um, and it still doesn't have us back to where we were at the end of May. It's just something to consider that of the three forecasts, I think this one is something I might look for some supporting data if I were a practitioner um, to go ahead and, and plan out my next six or so weeks. Not that it's inaccurate, um, just that it's something that I'd want some additional context perhaps as I'm thinking about planning. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dean, back to Dean for our question of the week. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, one of the topics we'd like to cover this week um, is uh, related to the question of, are we seeing a shift in spot to contract truckload volumes? Ken? This is interesting, right? We've been looking at this a lot. I, mean, I was on vacation last week running Snowflake SQL queries and I uh, locked myself in the master bedroom <laughs> while the kids were doing some home yeah, summer workbooks. I think we're certainly seeing some shift. I mean, the data supports that there is some shift. But what it doesn't support is that there's been this wholesale evaporation of volume in the spot market. As much as I've looked, right, that's the foundation. Because we, we've gotten a lot of customer questions about this. What the data doesn't suggest is that, because what they're seeing, let's put our, you know, and when I say customer, these are a lot of broker, pricing managers, forecasting managers, or directors that are reaching out to me and to Dean and others asking about, trying to juxtapose what they're reading or what they're hearing against what their data shows. And they're not seeing a drop off in volumes, but they're kind of curious if the market as a whole are seeing a drop off in spot volumes. And our data, you know, we see 
Uh, I'd have to go back and total it up, but of the 124 billion um, ton in annual freight transactions that we see, I think 60% of that is spot. I'd have to go back and check on that. Um, whenever that math works out to, we see quite a bit of volume and we just haven't seen it fall off. You know, it, are routing guides holding up, keeping more contract freight in, the, in, the, in that pipeline? I think so. Um, but I don't know that it's been, we're still seeing over a million drive in load posts per week on our board. Um, it's just that we've seen a lot more capacity, a lot more latent capacity in the spot market, which is, I think is driving rates down compared with the fuel pinch that's been happening. What are you, what are you seeing, Dean? Yeah, I'm seeing it's still a fairly healthy market. You know, last week we had a total of uh, 2.4 million load posts for all three equipment types combined. So that's down 40% year over year. Last year was, of course, an anomalous year, uh, but still about 15% better than where we were. So 15% worse off than where we were in 2020 as the market was recovering. So still, you know, still tracking above where we would expect the market to be. Um, in terms of total load post volumes in uh, compared to those two years. Interesting, we're tracking fairly closely with 2017 um, and fairly, and we're above by about 23%. Uh, uh, we're about 23% higher than 2018, which of course was our last best year that we can say was relatively normal in the spot market. So I think we're doing pretty well. We're certainly doing better than where we consider ourselves to be for the average of all of the prior years to 2020. I mean, again, the spot market is so much smaller than the contract market. Even if you look like a typical 80-20 split, right? 1%, uh, I'm sorry, 10% of, let's just use the percentages for a second and do some bad math. Even in a, a simple 80-20 split, if you see a 10% reduction in contract moving to spot, that goes from 20 to 28%. Um, spot volumes, right? So that's an increase of eight percentage points on a base of 20, um, which is huge, right? I think it's what, 40%. So, and then consequently, when we see a shift out of spot in the contract, it makes a smaller dent in the total contract piece. And which in contract is just this much more relatively stable. There might be some bumps under the rug, um, to borrow an old phrase, but by and large, it's not going to shift a ton um, compared to the spot market. But we're just not seeing Again, this kind of massive evaporation of volume. Rates have definitely come down. A really interesting conversation I was having with Chris Jolly yesterday um, on his morning show, which I encourage you to check out. Yep. Um, it, it's really great. He goes through some, um, I think, three articles. We never get through all three, but three three interesting articles every morning. It's really fun to go on there um, and talk. But the, the decline in spot rates was rapid. There's no doubt about that. But as they remain stable, I, I can't really show. I wish I had a whiteboard. But... Think about um, almost drawing a, a triangle. And let's just assume the drop was vertical. And now we're, we're kind of plodding along at this little flat period. The length of that third leg of the triangle becomes less and less sloped, right? So let's just say rates stayed absolutely flat through the end of the year. And you looked at from where they peaked out when in March, late February, rates were the highest through the end of the year. That seems like a very gentle slope. Right? I understand it happened very quickly, but at the end of the day, to get from point A to point B, we're really like amortizing out. Every week that rates remain stable or even tick up, we've actually amortized out some of that shock, yep. which I think is really interesting and not something I had thought about, at least front of mind. Um, I think it's really interesting. We're going to prepare some, some visuals and some analytics around that, but I mean, does that mirror kind of what you're seeing, Dean? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the big catalyst here was the rapid uh, increase in diesel prices that really impacted the market. So I think absent that, we'd be seeing a very different market right now. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting that we'll see uh, a levelling out of the spot rate decline. It certainly has been flat for the last four to five weeks. I expected after July 4 rates to drop a, a little bit quicker than what they have. I think diesel prices uh, dropping down has put some sort of a floor under that, which is... Uh, good for carriers operating predominantly in the spot market. Yeah, and make no mistake, it is still vastly more expensive to run a truck today than it was right. in 2018. So these comparisons we're making to 2018, uh, we carriers need a higher rate per mile to turn the same amount of profit, right? Um, so luckily they're getting that. We're, we're sort of about to cross the 2021 comp, 
or if we haven't already. But I mean, that was a line that was just shooting upwards. So someone made a really great comment I saw on LinkedIn yesterday that was, uh, you know, when you're going 85 and you slow down to 70, 70 seems slow, Mm -hmm. right? So when you're used to three something a mile and you're down to two something a mile, that seems light. But keep in mind, in May of 2020, we were at a buck 20 a mile, right? So these, it, it, it's all about like relative pricing levels, I think. Um, yeah, the uh, the drop in diesel prices this week has pulled my uh, in my truck that I've been running in this spreadsheet, this theoretical owner operator truck um, running a hundred thousand loaded miles a year, operating costs are right around two dollars a mile now, and fuel is down to seventy cents a mile, seventy seven cents a mile after being up um, almost eighty five cents a mile um, not too long ago. So this time a year ago, diesel was about fifty two cents a mile. So I'm about 25 cents a mile higher for fuel costs right now, even though they're coming down. So we think about where carriers are averaging at uh, $1.95 this week in terms of the baseline um, spot rate in dry van. At $2 a mile, all in operating costs, you know, taking into account everything, you know, spot, spot market carriers still aren't doing too bad. Because there's, as Chris and you spoke about on the show yesterday, Ken, there's a lot of lanes out there where the rates are much higher than the national average, of course, even our top 50 lanes are about 36 a mile higher. So I think this is a, there's good margins out there for carriers that have had incredibly high operating costs. I certainly don't see the doom and gloom that others have been talking about. And certainly anecdotally, the carriers I've been talking to are not talking about having a bad year. In fact, just go to any of the truck shows that are on all over the country at the moment, you'll see a vastly different industry than the one that's being written about. People are doing very well at the moment up. Right here, yeah, and I mean, you, you're going to have people on the margins, right? I mean, this, <laughs> I, overly attractive markets, like overly, like overbought markets, whatever you want to consider it, um, in any industry, right? Everyone's an excellent day trader and stock picker when every day the Dow's going up, right? You could pick anything and it's going to go up. Um, this is probably a bad analogy because I think they've never been able to prove that like a hedge fund manager can beat a monkey throwing a dart at the Wall Street Journal and when it comes to picking stocks. So I'll put that analogy back in the can. My point is good carriers are going to be good carriers right. in ups and downs. They have to be. Any carrier that's been in business for five years has seen three market cycles, uh, two, three market cycles. Um, so, you know, Poor business owners, people that maybe don't have experience, that don't have discipline. I, I I don't know what you think about this, Dean, but to me it comes down to discipline on the on the carrier side. It's being disciplined about your PL, disciplined about the loads you're taking, disciplined about when you're taking off time, um, the decisions you're making. The market from you know late 20 to early 22 largely lets you off the hook. Would you agree with that or do you think that's being too harsh? No, I think it does. Um you know, the, just on your pr previous point there, one of the things that I'm seeing carriers talk more about is revenue per day. Um, you know, rate per mile is important, but one of the one of the things that trademarks of successful carriers is they don't focus on rate per mile. They focus on revenue per day because they are very much aware in the post DLD era that time is absolutely critical. Um, a lot of the guys that are successful are looking for $1,500 a day, and that's not something that you know, the, the transactional market really thinks about because everyone is focused on a rate per mile. What the carrier wants to know about is how many miles can I get each day and I've got to get $1,500 revenue a day. And that's what the, that's the trademark of the successful carriers. If, um, if a broker puts a load on a carrier that's only 600 miles but it takes two days, um, their rate per mile has got to double. Right to make the same revenue per day. So that's how that's how successful carriers think about this market. And it's interesting, right? I've been out of the actual, you know, in the, you know, working the day to day for two and a half, coming up on three years now. So it was interesting. We were talking about Savannah. I was talking about this with some of our internal PR folks. And that's such an interesting port because of the inland concerns and some of the dynamics, right? Where Atlanta is roughly 250 miles away from Savannah, right? Mm -hmm. And with ELDs and with kind of traffic and load and unload times, it makes it really difficult as a single to get that there and back if you wanted to in a single yeah. hours. Yeah. Whereas with LA, you don't have that concern as much. All of the warehouse, the, the entire in, inland apparatus is right there by and large, right? There are Ontario. Um, 
So as we're seeing congestion move into and more volume move through Savannah, that, that presents an entirely different inland problem than it would um, Southern California. And I don't think, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see if, if any true retail freight is going to be shifted east um, heading into the Christmas shopping season. I don't know. That'd be interesting. That those ports aren't really designed to handle that type of freight at that volume. Mm. Would wouldn't you say? That's great. Yep. What's the space? So we've got some questions there, Ken. Um, yeah, let her rip. All right, Jim Thomas. What's causing diesel prices to drop since nothing has changed in the supply chain? That's a that's a good question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I mean, I think you're just seeing, comp I mean, this is maybe like not appropriate because it's a little bit of conjecture. I just think you're seeing margins come down a little bit. Yeah. I mean, where I live, the, the, the spread between diesel and gas was $2 a gallon for, for weeks on end, which is just no, right. there's no rational economic reason why that would be the case that I could discover. So, um, I mean, you have seen some supply constraints and, 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 and diesel and gas do operate in slightly different delivery mechanisms. But at the end of the day, I think you're just starting to see a normalization um, of margins, of prices, of, um, the, you know, demand does ebb back this time of year. So I mean, diesel prices, gas prices are more expensive the Friday before a holiday weekend normally, right? We're all used to that phenomenon. So I guess you're just seeing things ebb back. But... I don't know that there's any kind of super prudent rhyme or reason as to why prices have fallen. Yeah. Um, there's some theories that it's going to go back up due to some storage and inventory levels and refining capacity. Um, but that'll be interesting to track as we head into the fall. Yeah. Um, uh, two of um, Jim's question was, when do we see rates going back up? So let's, if we talk about dry van rates, um, what's your thoughts on when that'll happen? <laughs> um, so, I mean, we would expect seasonally rates to tick up through the fall, heading up into Black Friday, and then they dip down a little tiny bit, and then boom, right into uh, Christmas. I haven't seen a reason to change my sort of boilerplate prediction that we've been on the past few weeks of strength into the holidays. And then I do think we're going to see another kind of dip after return season in July, and, or July, January into February. Yep. Um, and then we should see... My, 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 my current operating hypothesis is that we'll see the market start to cycle back up late in Q1, perhaps early Q2 of next year. Right. But okay. there's going to be some volatility within our current market cycle. Yep. Yep. We put you on the spot, though, so yep. I'm not always on the spot. What do you think? Um, the easy answer is I'd agree with you. I think that... <laughs> I think diesel prices are going to continue coming down, uh, noting that there are some inventory questions being raised by some of the experts. I think the EIA forecast is looking pretty accurate, and that's going to keep um, a, a floor under spot rates through the end of the year. Um, Sand also asked the same questions. I think you've answered that one there. And the other question we have from Craig Carter is, any capacity predictions for trucks out of California for the fourth quarter? It's an interesting question. Um, I, I can't help but think there is some capacity issues looming because of AB5. The broader question is, um, what's the implication for carriers and brokers pulling freight into California for those that aren't domiciled in California because California law still applies? Um, experts I spoke to still haven't found out what the um, real answer is going to be. This may be, need to be tested in the courts, uh, but I think there are some pretty big implications. Even some of the large carriers are already telling already telling their independent operators to move out of the state. Uh, there's questions, serious questions around uh, capacity issues uh, for the rest of the year. I think once they start to enforce AB5. I mean, I think AB5 aside, it's going to be tight in Q4. Capacity is always tight in Southern California in Q4. I mean, in 2019, capacity was still tight. Like, let's not gaslight ourselves into thinking that like. Black Friday this year, you're going to be able to pick up the phone as a broker and cover a load, same day pickup in Southern California on your first call, exactly what you budgeted for in that load. Right. Like that didn't happen then. That's not going to happen now. I don't, I mean, it doesn't matter how many articles are written about it. It doesn't matter how many tweets are sent out about it. Capacity is going to be tight in Q4 in the major shipping markets. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, 
and I only have a, you know a ten year reference point here where I've been in the, in the industry, but you know pricing freight and dealing with freight over that time period, I can't think of a time period where it wasn't relatively tight during the retail shipping peak in the major retail shipping markets, like the warehousing and and um, drayage markets and, and the main thoroughfares east to west. Um, and if I'm off off mark on that, Dean, let me know. But I mean, I think will it be as tight as it was last year? Probably not. But that you know. That's maybe the difference between 10 calls to, to, to move a load as opposed to seven or six. Um, you're not going to have carriers calling you begging for, at least not in the major markets. I wouldn't imagine you're going to have carriers calling you begging for freight um, in, in the build up to um, retail peak this fall. I mean, FedEx, it just came out this morning. FedEx is going to institute their uh, retail peak charges. And again, I get it's parcel and small pack. It's a little bit different. But even they're starting to pull forward the surcharges this year, which should give everyone a pretty good indication that they're expecting healthy volumes this fall. Yep. Um, and credit card debt's a tomorrow problem. I mean, let's just face it. Like, t Let's think about human economics here. We're seeing record credit card debt, but there's probably still a lot of headspace. Jason Miller pointed out that the average debt per card is still relatively low and nowhere near compared um, to the last uh, major recession. So still a lot of headroom on those credit cards. Um, and I have to imagine a lot of that money is going to be spent this fall. Yep. Uh, so let's just keep that in mind. And uh, last question from John Pandol, a uh, question about uh, did East Coast based shippers avoid the West Coast in July because of predictions of labor problems, longshore new contracts and AB5? Anecdotally, John, I think the answer is yes. Uh, we're seeing based on July's data here, um, some of the year over year volumes suggest that uh, we're seeing a lot more volume hit to the East Coast compared to the West Coast. There is some shift in volume. Uh, we've just got the July data being processed right now. So if we can take that question on notice, we will let you know uh, what the year over year change. But the answer is yes, anecdotally, there's definitely been a shift in volumes to some of those ports along the Gulf Coast in particular and along the East Coast, mostly in Savannah and Charleston and Norfolk and, um, and New York in the Elizabeth market. All right, but if you start pumping millions of TEUs of T-shirts and consumer electronics into Savannah, that's a recipe for a very bad time. Yep. I don't care how much they've dredged that port. <laughs> the port's not going to handle it, and the inland operations are absolutely not going to handle that right. incremental volume. So again, yep. let's just keep in mind context and scale. Hey, real quick, uh, there was a question about flatbed rates, and I'll touch on it real quick and maybe turn it over to Dean to polish it, but I think it could be a long winter for flatbeds. I mean, I... It typically slows down. People don't like to move up north in the winter with all of the tarping and checking and all that stuff that happens with with the cold weather. Building starts up north tend to go down in, in, in the in the in the late fall, early winter. And I think with interest rates where they are and material costs still being high, you, you're probably going to see a lackluster housing market, which all spell a slower slower period for flatbeds coming off a couple amazing years mm -hmm. that they've had. But what do you think, Tim? I think they're going to track pretty closely towards 2018 levels as they've been doing since the halfway point of this year. Uh, they're certainly going to be, uh, my guess is they're going to be very close to where 2018 ended up uh, during the fourth quarter, which wasn't that dissimilar to 2017 either. Um, hurricane season is predicted to start ramping up shortly. Um, not about rapid season. That could change things pretty quickly like it did in 2017 with those two big Cat 5s that landed. Um, but I think 2018 rate levels would be the best guide there. I agree. It has been a quiet tropical season. And now that I'm back from Florida, again, yeah. I wish no harm on life or property, but they can spin up a couple big ones that just sort of right. scare us and then go back out to see a couple fish storms. I would be happy about that from a freight perspective. All right, we're running long. Tons of great questions. Wish we can get to them all. Uh, AskIQ at DAT.com um, if you have any more. Dean, quick plugs. Yeah, um, I'm on sales chatter tomorrow with Dan Deegan at DJ, 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, Stephen Pettit's on Landline now tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh, on Road Dog Radio Channel 146 and on Sirius XM. I'll be on with Jimmy Mack on Radio Nemo at 8 a.m. Um, don't forget, Break Safety Week is coming up on August 21. And, of course, DATCON, DAT's user conference, is on on October 5 to 7 in Austin. And uh, with guest speaker, NFL legend Terry Bradshaw. Yeah, I saw some Pittsburgh representation representing the 412 or the 724, I guess, depending on how far you are outside the city. Um, Terry Bradshaw will be there um, to, to, to speak to the crowd. Always a great event. I've, speak, I've spoken at two DATCONs as a customer. Unfortunately, with COVID, I've yet to go to one as a DAT employee. Um, but really great, super informational, much more for your frontline folks, your, your, your pricing folks, your, your capacity managers, your carrier sales reps, um, your account reps. 
Um, you know, really, really great. We have a ton of new products for you to come out and test in our labs. All of our experts will be there. Um, pretty much my entire staff uh, will be down in Austin. And it kicks off Aust the two-week Austin City Limit Festival if you're into music and barbecue, which who isn't? Um, I highly recommend checking it out. You can navigate over to DAT.com. I'm sure our wonderful marketing team has made it super easy to navigate to where you register. Um, so go ahead and check that out. Um, you'll get to see all of us in person. But with that, we are going to sign off. Again, thank you for all the really, really great questions. Uh, stay safe, stay cool, uh, and we will see you next week. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.